Um, um, good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to this um, monthly LGBT heritage um, project. Um, LGBT History Club event, and uh, this is in conjunction with um, the Linen Hall Library. And the speaker tonight is uh, Chris Reed, and Chris is a PhD candidate at the University of Ulster researching museum engagement with LGBTQ identity. And he intends in his PhD to demonstrate how the heritage sector in Northern Ireland can and should be an advocate for human rights issues. Chris has worked for both the National Trust and the Historic Royal Palaces. And it was during this time that he developed an LGBTQ plus tour at Hillsborough Castle, which um, I have attended and it was brilliant, which is why I thought Chris would be a great uh, speaker for our LGBT History Club. Um, Chris uh, normally runs the tours on the last Saturday of every month at Hillsborough Castle. They're not happening at the moment, obviously, but they will happen again um, in uh, 2021, and I'd highly recommend them. Uh, Chris's uh, talk tonight is called Queering the Castle. And uh, without further delay, I'll pass you over to Chris, and he'll take it from there. Chris. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am just going to share my screen. Give me one wee second. My laptop is operated by Crank, so it might just take a second. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and can you all hear me okay? Or can anybody not hear me particularly well? I can hear you fine, Chris. Okay, great. I don't know why I'm asking this because I can only see my, my PowerPoint now, so. <laughs> um, okay, look, um, thank you so much, Richard, for that introduction. And thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to give this talk. Um, I haven't been able to talk about Hillsborough's queer history for about nine months now. The last tour I gave was at the very end of February and even then I don't think I could have anticipated uh, that it could be a year or even more before I could get to do it again so it's been such a lovely opportunity it's been so nice for me this past week just reading through these stories again and falling in love with them all over again and um, to give you a bit of idea about my background as Richard said I've, I've worked for HRP and I've worked for the National Trust but I started out at Hillsborough Castle as an intern after I finished my master's and went on and did my PhD, which I'm finishing up hopefully this year or next year, um, and still worked alongside Hillsborough Castle and HRP um, to develop this tour. And it's something we launched last August um, and we ran every month. So it's something that's really embedded in the visitor offer. It's not something that we, we bring out for LGBT History Month or for Pride. It's something that is one of a number of specialist tours that people can take when they visit the estate. Um, and that was something that was really important to me from the beginning. I said that this needs to be as important as any of the other stories that we're trying to tell as well. And the long-term hope is that some of these stories will become embedded uh, in the general tour. And the plan is that next year that'll happen as well. So it's continuing to grow um, and it's, it's continuing or was continuing to get more popular. Um, but tonight I'm hoping to give you a bit of a virtual tour of Hillsborough. So I've got lots of photos to show you. and I'm going to talk through some of the stories that we tell. Um, but before I do that, I thought I would give you a very brief history of Hillsborough Castle for those of you that maybe don't know it very well. Um, I know that when I first started working there, I knew, I knew very little about its history beyond maybe more contemporary history. So I'll go through a bit of a, a run through of that before I get into the queer stories. Um, Chris, I suppose the first thing to point out. Chris, I, one thing right? I, I need to um, mute uh, everyone again. And uh, so I'm going to mute all and then you can unmute yourself, OK? OK, no worries. Give me one second. Okay, 
Um, so let me see. Da, da, da. Can you still see it full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think the first thing to point out to you is probably the most obvious um, is that Hillsborough Castle doesn't really look much like a castle. Um, it's a fairly traditional looking Irish country house. And you find this a lot in, um, in the history of Irish country houses. A lot of the families that came to Ireland um, wanted to make it appear that they'd been here much longer than they maybe had been. Um, and to really uh, accentuate their antiquity and that they're, they're not new money, they're old money. So a lot of them would refer to their properties as castles when in fact they weren't. Um, and Hillsborough Castle was built by the Hill family, so hence the name Hillsborough. Um, and this, uh, it was built in the mid 1700s, but this is a photo from really the late 1800s. Um, and this shows some members of the family posing outside the house um, after they've performed a theatrical inside. And I just really love this photo because I think it looks, I mean, it's camp as hell when you look at it, um, but it also shows you um, a small insight into the stuff that was going on in the house when the Hill family were living there. Um, and it was owned by them up until the 1920s when they put it on the market. Um, they weren't using it as much anymore. And they were using their properties in England uh, more frequently, so they wanted to sell it. And rather conveniently at that time, um, for the newly formed Northern Ireland government, it went on to the market. So following partition, um, the new government here uh, was looking for a residence for the new role of the governor. Um, and they purchased Hillsborough Castle and it became government house. Um, and by proxy, it then became the official residence of the royal family when they're in Northern Ireland, the British royal family when they're in Northern Ireland. Um, and it remained that way up until 1972, um, when direct rule was imposed on Northern Ireland. So the Northern Ireland government was abolished, the role of governor was abolished, and we were governed directly by Westminster. Um, and at that point, the title of Secretary of State was created, and we still have the Secretaries of State today. Um, I think we've had the majority of them in the past four or five years, um, but they still use Hillsborough Castle as their official residence when they're in Northern Ireland as well. And it's really been in the more recent history that Hillsborough Castle has become a place for um, political discussions, for negotiations, um, and has become a really important um, space for the development of the peace process in Northern Ireland as well. So just to give you an insight into some of the events that have taken place there, um, this is an image of, of the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and uh, the tea shop Garrett Fitzger Garrett Fitzgerald um, signing the Anglo-Irish Agreement in the drawing room in 1985. Um, we had Tony Blair, um, the Secretary of State, Mo Molum talking about the Good Friday Agreement outside Hillsborough Castle. Um, this photo was taken a couple of years after um, the Good Friday Agreement when conversations were still taking place. So you have um, the late Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams um, and the late John Hume on the left and also um, the Taoiseach Bertie Ahern there too. Um, in 2005, um, Queen met with the then President of Ireland, Mary McAleese. Um, and this was the very first time um, uh, the head of the British state had met with the head of an independent Ireland um, on the island of Ireland. Um, and some people think it was this event that led to the, the royal visit to Dublin a number of years later. Um, there's George Bush meeting with Tony Blair in the gardens. Um, I believe they were talking about the recent invasion of Iraq in this photo. Um, Leo Varadkar visited last year with Taoiseach and held a press conference in the throne room. Um, and at the end of last year, um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge or Wills and Kate uh, met with members of the public in the drawing room as well. So the reason I've shown these photos is to show you that it, it is still very much a working royal residence and a political residence. It's still very much functional. Um, and whilst it is now a publicly accessible heritage site, it's still used today. And I think it's also important to point out that, you know, some of those events that I showed in the images there were not very popular, some of them were popular, some of them have been controversial, some of them have been, have been contentious. And these are all the types of stories that are being told at Hillsborough Castle at the moment. Um, and it's being told by historic royal palaces. So HRP took on the management of Hillsborough Castle back in 2014 and officially opened it to the public in 2019. So just spring of last year. Um, 
And as a charity, um, it looks after a number of other properties as well, all based in London. So it looks after the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Kensington Palace, Kew Palace and Banqueting House and Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland as its most recent property. Um, uh, can you uh, uh, put on your video again? Oh, has it gone off? Sorry. Give me one wee second. Da, da, da. You really want to see my face, Richard? Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right. Sorry about that. Uh, da, da, da. Um, so, yeah, so HRP, as I said, uh, started to recognize that the stories that were being told in their properties were focusing too much on a very specific narrow group. And it was primarily stories relating to white, male, um, upper class, uh, non disabled, cisgendered. That every time I list out that list, you realize that is a very specific group that we're talking about. Um, and for a very long time, we felt that it's those stories that had to be told because we've always been told that that is the truth. And so they started to explore different narratives and trying to unpick their stories in a different way. And, and for a long time, as an organization and other organizations too, we've talked about hidden. and as relevant as any other story that is told in properties like this, in our museums, in our libraries, in our heritage sites, they deserve to be told. And so when I started developing the tour for Hillsborough, it was that mindset that I had in my head the whole time, that these stories are equally as important and deserve to be told. Um, so I'll, I'll jump straight into it. Um, we have and the people that we know have visited Hillsborough, but we know there's more to do. We need to look more at working class histories at ethnic minority histories as well. So lots more to do, but hopefully this is a good start anyway. Um, so we're going to make our way into the state entrance hall. Um, this has always been the entrance hall at Hillsborough Castle since it was first built in the 1700s. Everyone comes in through this door, visitors come in through this door, royalty, politicians, everyone uses this front door. Um, and I'm going to focus on the painting on the top left at the back wall there. Um, and in that painting, we have, um, uh, I suppose, maybe an unfamiliar image of William of Orange. Um, now, many of us, particularly if you live in Ireland, are familiar with the story of William of Orange or William III. Um, he is famous for um, deposing King James II, who was a Catholic king, and following a series of battles in Ireland, um, most significantly the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, um, he became the new Protestant king and took the throne by force. Um, and we're all familiar with that story. And actually, it was on his way to that battle uh, that William stayed in the original residence of the Hill family, Hillsborough Fort, which is also in Hillsborough um, and is looked after by HRP and is just across the road. Um, so we had a real connection to William at Hillsborough Castle. We have this painting and we have his visit as well. But what's perhaps less well known um, is the fact that during his reign, William was the subject of rumors and allegations regarding his relationships with other men. Um, and there were lots of different reasons as to why these rumors emerged. Um, and if you look at historians, they will argue different stories depending on who you read. And interestingly, if you look at British historians, they are very, very keen to point out that these were just rumors and allegations and nothing more. Whilst if you look at Dutch historians, um, they're much more open to the possibility of something more. And the rumors were centered around two men in particular. Um, and I've stolen these images um, from the National Trust website. And these are actually on display at Mount Stewart. Um, so I, 
I'm showing a competitor property. Um, but on the left, you have um, Hans Willem Bentinck, um, who also later became the Earl of Portland. And please excuse the dinging of that clock. It's also not the right time, so it's probably going to go off again. Um, and on the right, you have uh, Arnold Just van Keppel, um, who would later become the Earl of Albemarle. And these were two Dutch courtiers who had come with William uh, from the Netherlands to England uh, and were part of his royal court. And the early rumours centred around Bentinck, who's on the left. And he had known William since he was a young boy. They were very, very close. Um, and what you started to see around the 1690s were poems, print materials, tracts being published, alleging that the king and Bentinck were having a relationship. Um, so I have some of the poems here. They're quite brilliant. Um, this one was published in the early 1690s, and it says, he is not qualified for his wife because of the cruel midwife's knife. Yet buggering of Bentinck doth please to the life a dainty fine king indeed. Um, and another one is, is meant to be in the voice of William of Orange. And it says, uh, come here, my Bentinck, and indulge thy charms, more dear than untouched virgins to my arms. For thee I have abandoned womankind and all my wishes to that arse confined. Um, so there's no beating around the bush about what they were trying to suggest back in the 1690s. Um, but what's really interesting about these stories is that, as I said, many historians try to suggest that they were merely rumours. We have to remember that William had taken the throne by force. There were still a lot of people who were still loyal to James II. And so they suggest that perhaps people were trying to undermine his rule. Um, others have thought that perhaps, um, uh, where is he? Bentinck on the left and other members of the royal court were very jealous that William started to take more interest in Keppel, who's on the right. Uh, because following the death of his wife, William was devastated. We know that he was devastated. He was very publicly mourning her, which at the time people did not like. They thought it was um, too feminine. They didn't like that he wasn't being a strong, quiet king. Um, and Keppel, uh, comforted him. Keppel became very close to him and it's at that point that we believe that the two of them built a relationship together as well. Um, and in fact uh, at the time the uh, Venetian ambassador was visiting London and he reported back to Venice uh, saying his majesty regards Keppel with pleasure as if he is a tender plant that he himself wanted to cultivate in the hope that it will bear fruit. And the rumours at that point really started to kick off and they became so prevalent that Bentinck himself wrote to William in 1697 saying that he was going to resign from his royal court um, in what appeared to be disgust at the rumours. Um, and he said to him, the kindness which your majesty has for a young man and the way in which you seem to authorise his liberties and impertinences uh, make the world say things that I am ashamed to hear. And in a very rare comment on the subject, William himself replied and said, it seems to me a most extraordinary thing that one may not feel regard and affection for a young man without its being criminal. Now, we don't know what the truth is regarding these stories. Um, it's very much possible that William did have relationships with both of these men. Um, I certainly know what my opinion is on the matter. Um, but I think this is a really fascinating example of the challenge we face when we try to present queer stories, because so often people will demand evidence. And if there isn't evidence, then they'll be very quick to uh, discredit them. But we don't demand that same evidence of heterosexual stories. We don't demand diary entries and the detailed sexual encounters, the assumption is always there that this person was heterosexual unless there's evidence to suggest otherwise. Um, and I think that really needs to change. And I think that William is a perfect example of how that should change. Um, so staying in the same room, um, this is another painting that's on display just beside William, and this is of Mary of Motna. And she was the wife of James II, who William of Orange defeated at the Battle of the Boyne. And this is one of my favourite 
paintings in Hillsborough Castle. Um, it depicts her uh, wearing 17th century uh, riding attire, a riding habit. Um, but what's really interesting is that she's had herself depicted wearing uh, a male riding habit. So she's here wearing men's clothes. Um, she's also had her hair styled to look like she's wearing a man's wig. And what's really fabulous when you're standing in the, the entrance hall at Hillsborough is that we have other really amazing paintings of, of female monarchs. And most of them have been painted looking off in the distance, looking very wistful, or um, some of them even in almost a state of undress, very much for the male gaze. Whilst Mary has had herself painted looking straight at the observer with her hand on her hip, with her whip in her hand. Um, and the only real allusion to her femininity is uh, a very fairly strategically placed open pink pocket. Um, but I think what's really fascinating about this is that it's a real insight into 17th century fashion ideas, but also people's attitudes towards gender at that time as well. I think we can sometimes think that we are this growing progressive society. I think some people maybe think that um, things continue to get better and better and better and better. Um, but the truth is, I think that we're living in a time when gender identity in particular um, is under attack and people are being made to feel uh, less than in a way that perhaps might not have been the same in the past. And I don't want to overgeneralize, but what you're seeing is people playing with gender um, changing what they wore in a way that was acceptable, that isn't necessarily today. Um, and I think this painting is such a beautiful insight into that as well. And perhaps a reminder that what is happening right now um, should not be happening and can be changed as well. Um, so moving out of the uh, the entrance, we're going to move into the throne room. So this is probably the biggest room in Hillsborough Castle. This is very much the ceremonial heart of the building. Um, and it's a piece of ceremonial object that I'm going to talk about in this room. Um, and it all centres around a collection of objects known as the Irish Crown Jewels. Um, so I'm sure we've all heard of the Crown Jewels that are held in the Tower of London. Um, but a lot of people haven't heard of the Irish Crown Jewels, which were a collection of objects and insignia belonging to the Order of St. Patrick. And on the 6th of July, 1907, it was discovered that the jewels had been stolen from within inside uh, a locked safe uh, within Dublin Castle, inside a vaulted room, without any force. And no one could understand how this had taken place. And all eyes looked to the man who was in charge of taking care of these objects. Um, and that was a man called Sir Arthur Vickers. And that's him on the right. Um, and the object on the left is the Ulster King of Arms tabard. And that belonged to Sir Arthur Vickers. And we have it on display in the throne room. Um, it's currently on display in Dublin Castle as part of an exhibition. So hopefully when, when we're able to, um, we can go and see it there. And hopefully it eventually comes back to Hillsborough Castle because um, I love telling this story. Um, but as I said, all eyes turned to Vickers um, because rumours had circulated at the time that he was fairly careless when it came to looking after the jewels. Um, in fact, on one occasion, it was believed that he woke up with the jewels draped around his neck with no recollection of how they possibly could have gotten there. Um, now, Vickers completely denied any involvement in this, and he was very quick to blame his assistant, Francis Shackleton. Uh, the two of them shared a house uh, when they were in Dublin, and it's believed and was accepted at the time that Shackleton was described as a homosexual, um, and he was certainly queer, and many believe that the two of them were having a relationship as well. Um, and Shackleton was also a close friend of the Duke of Argyll, who was King Edward VII's brother-in-law. So I'm throwing a lot of names at you here. Um, but this became important later on because the reason it was discovered the jewels were missing was because Edward VII uh, was on his way to Ireland to perform an investiture. So he needed the jewels. And when Vickers went to get them, he discovered they were gone. Now, Edward VII was said to be absolutely furious. 
you know, this was the early 20th century. He saw this as a real slight against the British monarchy, and he wanted the perpetrator to be brought to justice. So he ordered a royal commission. Uh, a police investigation was launched, and they were determined to discover who had done this. But mysteriously, within two weeks, the royal commission was shut down, and the police investigation was largely hushed up. Um, and to this day, the jewels have never been found. We don't know what happened to them. Um, and there are still rumours uh, about what might have, have come of them. Um, but one of the more popular stories is uh, that Shackleton himself, the assistant of Sir Arthur Vickers, took them um, by getting Vickers drunk, uh, taking the key to the safe where they were held, making a wax impression, making a copy, going back and taking them in the night and selling them off somewhere. And they think that the reason the king hushed up the investigation uh, was because he discovered that Vickers, um, or sorry, Shackleton, was very close friends with his brother-in-law, the Duke of Argyle, who also was the subject of many uh, rumours regarding his own sexuality at the time. So it all sounds very complicated, but essentially what we think might have happened is the king was trying to stop his monarchy um, from being involved in a homosexual scandal. Um, which is the last thing the British monarchy needed at that time. And the other grand monarchies of Europe were starting to fall all around Europe, and he did not need anything um, getting in the way of his own power as well. So I think, it's, I think it's really fascinating that what feels like wasn't that long ago, about 100 years ago, um, homosexuality and the, the risk of being associated with it um, was a justification to hush up an investigation into something that was stolen uh, of huge, huge significance. Um, and as for Vickers, who's in the image, um, he was largely blamed for the theft because of his ineptitude, and he was stripped of his titles and he lost his job. Um, and we know that we, he spent the rest of his life in relative obscurity uh, in his country house in, in County Kerry, um, where he was eventually um, assassinated by the IRA and his house was burnt to the ground. So not the happiest end for Arthur Vickers. Um, and the, the case of the, the missing jewels still remains a mystery to this day as well. Um, we're going to move out of the throne room and go into my favourite room in the house, which is the red room. Uh, so named for the fact that it has red walls. Um, and this room is absolutely adorned with paintings. Um, it's done in a cabinet style. One of our my colleagues describes it as a, as a jewellery box. And I think that's a really, a really apt way of describing it. Um, but in this room, I'm going to focus on one painting in particular. Um, I took this photo on my phone, so I apologise it looks like I took it on a Nokia 3310 back in 2004. Um, but again, such a gorgeous, gorgeous painting and also the oldest painting in the collection at Hillsborough Castle. It dates back to the late 15th century, um, so more than 500 years old. Um, and we're really, really lucky to have it. Now, before I go into detail about who is depicted in the image, um, I'm sure some of you know who they are, um, I want to focus a little bit on a bit of queer art interpretation um, and this was a method that I really loved when I went on the LGBT tour of the National Gallery of Ireland which is run by uh, Kate Trinan um, and also the Tate in London to be a lot of queer art interpretation as well and if we just look at this painting without any context all we see are two men embracing one another in a very intimate way and depictions of queer lives in art is a fairly new phenomenon. It's not something that queer people in the past would have had access to. We wouldn't have had access um, to queer imagery like this. Um, and so what you find is individuals will, I suppose, interpret their own meaning by what they see in artworks. And we still do that today. We still look to individuals, to artists, to performers who might not themselves be queer or what we would understand to be queer but we can feel an affinity towards them and I like to think that this painting is a really lovely example of that um, because if that painting had been created with the intent of depicting two men in love with one another uh, then I think it's very unlikely that it would have survived 
into the present day. Um, I mean, what the painting actually depicts is um, St. Dominic embracing St. Francis of Assisi. Um, it's meant to be an interpretation of their meeting in 1216 in Rome. Um, and to this day, that meeting is still celebrated um, by Franciscans and Dominicans um, who meet on their respective feast days. Um, but when I was reading about St. Francis and when I was reading about this painting, I find some really interesting queer elements to his life as well. There have been some stories around the fact that he admitted um, women into his all-male brotherhood, provided they uh, accepted the title brother and they shaved their hair. He loved to be called mother um, by his followers. And actually, into the 20th century, you find depictions of St. Francis in queer artworks, particularly around um, the 1980s, um, during the AIDS epidemic, where uh, he's depicted treating individuals um, afflicted with AIDS because he was known to have treated lepers. And a lot of queer artists associated the two, these um, individuals who are being ostracized by society um, for a terrible illness out of their control. And he was seen as this sort of, of symbol of hope and of caring um, for both. So I think he's a really beautiful um, example. And as I say, this is, I really hope you all get to come and see Hillsborough Castle if you haven't been before, because this painting really is, it's stunning. Um, so moving on from uh, the Red Room, we're going to go into the dining room. Um, it doesn't always look like this, but I think this is just looks rather fabulous. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, a few stories in this room, but I'm going to primarily focus on stories um, about women, because you might have noticed that most of the stories I've told have related to men in particular. Um, and that is a problem, and again, something else that we really need to work on. Um, the male stories have been easier to pull out for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, because men were uh, criminalized for same-sex activities, um, but also because male perspectives were predominantly being told at the time as well. Um, but what, of course, we're finding with all our amazing um, women historians now is that actually women's lives were much more complex um, and, uh, I suppose, filled with a lot more autonomy than perhaps has been presented in the past as well. Um, so first individual, I just said I'm going to talk about women, but we're going to open with a man and a picture of three men. Um, I'm going to focus on the man on the left of this picture. So this is the third Marquis of Downshire who lived at Hillsborough Castle. I should have said the Hill family's title was Downshire. So if I talk about the Downshires, um, that's who I'm talking about. So he was the third Marquis of Downshire, and this is a sketch of him uh, with his brothers. Um, but again, I really, really love this sketch as well. Um, and in July 1810, he was on his way back to Hillsborough uh, following a trip to England. And he was making his way through me uh, Wheels when he arrived at a cottage in North Wheels. Um, and it was there that he met with these two women, um, who some of you might know. Um, this is Sarah Ponsonby and Eleanor Butler. Um, who later became known as the Ladies of Glen Um I hope there's nobody Welsh on the call because I am butchering your beautiful language, but the Ladies of Glen Gochlan became their name because that is where they settled. Um, but they were actually two uh, women who lived in Ireland. Um, Eleanor Butler lived in Kilkenny Castle. Um, and it was during their time in Ireland that they met uh, and we believe that they fell in love. It was believed that they enjoyed long walks together. They enjoyed French literature. Um, and they decided that they wanted to elope, that they were going to be together. Um, and so they made several attempts to run off together. Um, and every time they were caught by their families and sent back home. And eventually they managed to persuade them or their families just gave up and let them go on their way. Um, they gave them some money and told them to go have a life together. Um, I'm not sure it was as happy as that, but that is what they ended up doing. And they made their way to North Wales, where they settled in Glencochlan. And at that time, they became a real oddity. It became a real privilege and a piece of social standing to go and visit the ladies of Glencochlan. Um, and that is exactly what the third Marcus was doing when he met with them. 
And after he visited, he wrote to his mother, who was living at Hillsborough Castle, and said, This morning, Sir Philip and I walked up to see the ladies with whom I am quite in love. We stayed a full hour with them. They beg you will call on them when you go by. Now, it wasn't just the third Marquess who was visiting them. William Wordsworth knocked on their door. Uh, Queen Charlotte was fascinated by them. They were this, particularly in Europe, figure of two women living together and people couldn't quite get their heads around it. And when I was first researching this, I, I admittedly didn't know a lot about the ladies of Glengoglin and I interpreted it as the third Marquess of Downshire being very open-minded and open to the idea of their relationship. Um, this very queer relationship of two women living together, um, of sharing a home, of signing letters together as if they were a married couple, of sharing a bed with one another. Um, but in reality, I don't imagine it was an open-mindedness. I think it was more likely um, an inability to possibly believe that two women um, could have a sexual relationship with one another or a romantic relationship with one another and um, without a man being present because heaven forbid, what would they do? Um, and he wasn't the only one who felt that way. Um, they were famously described as the most famous virgins of Europe. Um, so we shouldn't mistake this fascination with them um, with an open-mindedness to who they were. Um, but I think they're a wonderful, wonderful example, again, of some of the contested ways in which queer history is talked about. There are people who will still argue that they, they weren't lovers, they weren't partners, um, they were merely two friends that lived together. Um, but I think we all know how most of us probably feel about that narrative. <laughs> um, now, about 20 years after his visit to the ladies of Glen Gochlin, um, the third Marcus of Downshire was having some problems with his oldest son, uh, Lord Hildborough. And this painting hangs in the dining room at Hildborough Castle. It's just above the fireplace. Um, and Lord Hildborough was at university. He just turned into his early 20s. Um, and he'd gotten into a really bad habit of killing people. Um, and so far, our curators have managed to find that he killed at least four men during his life. Um, they all appeared in the press, and being a member of the aristocracy, he usually got away with it. Um, but this particular kill um, took place in the quad at Oxford, and he killed in a fight um, the most uh, the favourite son of the Marquis of Liverpool. And the Downshire family... His father in particular thought, this won't do. Uh, and Lord Hillsborough had a bit of a habit of talking to the press as well. So they needed to get him away. They needed to get him out of the country. And thankfully, he was at the age where most young men of his class would be going on the grand tour. They'd be traveling around Europe, um, some of them pilfering antiquities to bring home with them. Um, and also as a way to make them more intellectual and to see the world as well. But... They decided as a family that his going to the usual hot spots of Italy, uh, Greece, um, wouldn't do because he would run into too many people and probably run his mouth a little bit and possibly get into trouble as well. Um, so they decided to send him to Scandinavia. And he started his trip in Denmark. And it was in Denmark where he met um, this woman um, who... Many of you might recognize her. So this is Anne Lister, um, otherwise known as Gentleman Jack. Um, and she featured in a really brilliant BBC uh, adaptation of her life um, last year. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's still an iPlayer if you haven't seen it already. Um, but she is really famous for her detailed encrypted diaries um, where she writes about her relationships with women in great detail. And she's very, very clear that she is not interested in having relationships with men. In fact, she wishes on some occasions that she had been born a man because it would align better for her with her attractions. And she was known to dress in very masculine attire, um, so much so that she gained the nickname, as I said, Gentleman Jack. And when Lord Hillsborough met her in Denmark, she was about 20 years older than him. And the two of them traveled around together. And we have correspondence between the two of them where they write to one another um, and talk about their trips. We know that when they encountered um, border checks, 
um, she told people that she was his wife. Um, we know that both of them wrote to each other about how attractive they thought the Princess of Denmark was um, and continued their correspondence uh, until her death. So a really close relationship and we were really just on the cusp of finding out a bit more around when COVID hit. So we're hoping to get the time to do a bit more research into that. But we don't know exactly the details of their friendship or their relationship. But given all that evidence, um, we really hope that Lord Hillsborough was aware of her relationships with women. Um, also the way she presented herself as well. Um, he was very comfortable traveling around with her and I think she is such a fascinating figure um, and somebody that, um, she is actually an example of somebody that we really hope will feature in the general tour as well. Um, and as I say, we're hoping to be able to find out a bit more about her as well. Um, so I've got another story that I wanna share that doesn't actually feature on the tour. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. The, the first is that we didn't have time, unfortunately. Um, and we also discovered the story of Anne Lister. Um, I should also admit that um, we, we didn't come across this story through some amazing curatorial or academic research. Um, we only discovered that uh, Anne knew Lord Hillsborough because his name was mentioned in the BBC programme about her life. Um, so I'm pretty sure one of my colleagues was sitting watching it and freaked out and emailed everybody saying, oh my God, we need to start researching this. And that's when we uncovered all this correspondence and um, that's held in her archive. So I suppose it's a bit of an indication into the way you can stumble across queer stories um, as much as you can set out to research them as well. Um, but as I said, the story that I'm going to talk about um, relates to these two women. Um, and the other reason that we haven't told it is that we we don't know enough about it yet for us to interpret it the way we want to or to get it across the way we want to but maybe some people here will have different thoughts on that or be able to give some advice on that as well um but the the woman on the left is a woman called jean welsh carlisle um, and in the 1850s she struck up a friendship um, and a correspondence with the fourth marchioness of downshire uh, Lady Nina, who's in the sketch on the right. Um, and she was actually the wife of the fourth Marquis who traveled around with Anne Lister, um, Lord Hillsborough. Um, and they struck up a bit of a friendship and we know from correspondence between the two of them that they were visiting one another and they were writing letters to one another. Um, and Jane Walsh Carlyle uh, was a Scottish writer uh, and she was part of what was described as a bit of a celebrity couple of their day and um, because her husband was um, a famous essayist called Thomas Carlyle. Um, and despite their relative wealth um, and her husband's success, uh, letters and diary entries written by Jean really reveal a woman very unhappy uh, with her marriage and very frustrated uh, that her own literary talents, which were exceptionally strong, um, were often overshadowed by her husband's, um, simply by virtue of his sex. Um, and it was during her marriage to him that she started a long lasting relationship with another writer called Geraldine Dewsbury. Um, and in a letter to Jean, she said, I feel to love you more and more every day, and you will laugh, but I feel towards you much more like a lover than a female friend. And in their letters, the two would often argue with one another, they would often bicker. Um, but in the end, it was Geraldine um, who took care of Jean uh, when she became ill towards the end of her life. Um, and when she eventually died, she revered to her as the friend of my heart. So a real intimate relationship between the two of them. Um, and in 1857, uh, Jean wrote to a friend describing her upcoming visit uh, to East Hampstead Park. And East Hampstead Park was one of the English residents of the Hill family. So that's where Lady Nina, who's on the right, would have been. Um, and she wrote to her friend and described Lady Nina as an acquaintance I have made myself in a romantic sort of way. She has been very kind to me all winter, coming to see me and sending me game and beautiful flowers. And she goes on to say that Lady Nina is a most lovely, natural woman. Now, we don't have any correspondence 
from Jane, uh, I'm sorry, from Lady Nina. So we don't know what Lady Nina was replying to Jane. We don't know um, if there was some sort of relationship between the two of them. But it certainly seems clear that uh, Jane was quite enamoured by Lady Nina. And again, this is another example of a story that we would we would like to explore a bit more. It's very much possible that this is merely Victorian language. Um, but given Jean Wells Carlyle's past relationships and given how little we know about Lady Nina, um, it's something that we really want to explore more. Um, and again, I think that's another example of the need or the expectation of evidence and how that can be a real hindrance towards telling these stories. Because as I said, we wouldn't need detailed love letters. We wouldn't need detailed diaries to confirm whether a heterosexual relationship existed because the structures of our society made it possible for those people to live very open lives and live very openly and discuss openly their love with each other, for each other. And that was through marriage. Um, in many cases, that was through having children. And those structures didn't exist in the past. Um, hopefully future historians have a bit of an easier time of it. So we do have to look at stories like this one and consider different interpretations of their lives. Um, so I'm just going to finish by saying that for me, I, I feel really passionately about telling these stories and, and I feel very strongly that they are as important as any other story that we tell at Hillsborough Castle. Um, and we plan for this to continue to grow. We want to find more stories. We want to do more research. And we want to be able to talk about this more and more and more. And as I said, it's my hope that more of these stories will become embedded um, in the general tour as well. Um, because the stories are there. And what I find really fascinating during this research is that, yes, at times it has been a bit tricky, but Hillsborough Castle is one house. It's one property, and within that, we've uncovered all these different queer stories. So why are more places not telling them? Why are we still standing in the way of doing so? Hopefully, moving forward, more places will. Um, so hopefully you've enjoyed this. It's been a very fast trip through Hillsborough Castle. Um, when you're in the house and when you're seeing the images and when you're getting the context, um, you get a real feel for the place. Um, I do hope you all come um, uh, to visit when it is safe to do so. Um, so thank you very much. And happy to take any questions if you have any, but I'll, I'll hand back to, to Richard. Chris, thank you so uh, much. That was um, so educational and entertaining, uh, which is a, a great combination. And um, let's just commend you and your colleagues at Hillsborough Castle because it's not what I and many others expected to find in rural County Down and it just shows you how um, the sector is, is changing and the queer history and queer stories are being told. In terms of questions, um, the easiest way for you to send in questions is if you put them into the chat and then I can um, um, convey them to, um, to uh, uh, Chris because um, I've opted for well, maybe I'll switch to gallery view now so I can also see you. But um, uh, if you put them into chat, that would be very helpful. And I've, I can see now some people saying, thank you very much, Chris. Fantastic. Um, really enjoyed it. So interesting. These are the comments coming through. But while I'm waiting for the first question, can I just say, um, how have um, the public um, responded to this inclusion of... Um, some queer history and stories uh, in what you offer at uh, at Hillsborough. Um, it's been it's actually been really positive. I mean, we've received the sort of usual negative um, social media comments that you get from people who've never come on the tour or people who never will come on the tour. Um, so I think you can expect those, and you always take those with a pinch of salt. Um, I think we really worried, admittedly, about talking about William of Orange, for example, so openly. Um, but again, we haven't had a huge amount of negativity around him. Um, so I think, I think people are more open to these stories being told than you would necessarily think. Um, I think people want to hear about them. Um, I think you're always going to get negativity, but 
the tour the tour really was starting to grow. It's so it was so disappointing that we had to stop because the numbers were starting to increase month by month by month. And and Hillsborough, as I said, only opened um to the public. Uh, that's 